Welcome to Let's Talk. Here we will focus on the hustle, the juggle, and everyday struggle of small business. About their everyday struggles, stresses, and ways they have been able to overcome the challenges of running their business. We welcome questions and comments, so please feel free to email us at admin at plemonscpa.com. We hope you enjoy, and above all, we hope it helps. Welcome to the Hustle, Juggle, and Struggle of Small Business. Today, you have in the studio Mr. Larry Hobbs of Management Resolve. Welcome, Larry. How are you? I'm I'm fine, thank you. I appreciate the invitation to uh, speak on uh, discipline at work. Oh, this is going to be a hot topic for sure during this COVID era. So let's talk about that. So talk about the potential different approaches to discipline. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, discipline is not as popular in the workplace as it was 20 and 50 and 100 years ago. And uh, I'll tell you the reason for that. Uh, uh, supervisors and managers are reluctant to use discipline the way they used to. And there's a few reasons for that. One is uh, the most common employee in the United States now is a millennial person born between 1980 and 2000. And they're pretty independent. And their work life and their personal life is divided 50-50. And they don't like criticism. And any time that a supervisor or a manager uh, uses discipline, uh, it's a judgment. And people don't like to be judged today. And uh, it, it, it's also a uh, an observation about something that uh, they don't approve of or a rule violation. And people are just more sensitive today uh, than they've ever been before in the workplace. And so supervisors have learned that discipline is really a form of confrontation. Mm. It's, it's judging, and it could lead to a confrontation. And so they're reluctant to do that. And then there's another reason that that, uh, uh, employers really don't think about very often. But the state of Texas and the federal government has mandatory posters that go on your bulletin board. Uh, There's about four Texas posters and about – uh, six or seven federal posters, depending on the nature of your business. And on every one of these posters is a 1-800 toll-free number that a disgruntled employee, an unhappy person, or someone who's been disciplined or terminated, they can call these numbers, whether it's a Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Texas Workforce Commission, OSHA, regarding safety or the uh, the U.S. Department of Labor, and they can make an accusation anonymously against the employer, and that will cause that federal or state agency to launch an investigation and hassle in the sense of investigating or auditing uh, that employer, and that's, a, that's an employee or an ex-employee revenge. And so – Employers, supervisors, and managers are aware of this problem, and so they want to avoid judgment and confrontation, and that's the reason that I'm saying this, that uh, it's just not as uh, common today to use uh, discipline as it was uh, many, many years ago. Understood, and that can be quite intimidating because those posters – are mandated to be in those offices just for that reason alone. So let's talk a little bit about warnings. You know, what's the difference between a warning and, say, an action where you're fired? Because we know in the state of Texas, it's a right-to-work state. So what's the difference? Yes, in a right-to-work state, that means that the uh, M. It really has more to do with uh, forming unions, but in a in a right to work state, 
the employee has a choice of whether they're going to work in a union setting or a non-union setting. They have more of a choice. Uh, but Texas is a, an at-will state, and an at-will state means that the employer and the employee are both there voluntarily. And if the employee or the employer wants to terminate the employment uh, a relationship, they have the right to do that. They're their employee and the employer are there at their own will. And that's what that's about. But uh, back to your question about warnings, uh, we don't use the word warning as much now as we did uh, years ago because it, it's a rather uh, harsh word. When you look up the definition of warning, it's it's a rebuke, it's a reproof, or it's a reprimand. And uh, we don't talk to people that way anymore. Now we use, uh, when we have a written uh, form of discipline, uh, we call it a written reminder, which is a re- to remind the employee of what they agreed to or what the training was about or what the policy is. Or we use something called a corrective action. It used to be a written warning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a warning is interpreted now as uh, uh, to criticize sharply, to turn back, to keep down, to give advance notice, uh, to notify or evaluate in advance that there's a, uh, there's a danger coming. Like when we receive a, uh, a weather warning and and it's a tornado warning it means there is a tornado somewhere in your vicinity and likely there will be damage and and we just don't want to talk to people that way uh anymore uh in in this economy right now we're having trouble in employment uh finding good people uh there're plenty of jobs and there's plenty of people but we're looking for good people who uh, have a good work ethic and are honest and have good attendance and those sorts of things. And so we don't want to do anything to intimidate or insult people. And yet we have policies, uh, procedures, uh, safety rules, work rules, uh, employee handbooks that uh, management has to uh, enforce those. And sometimes there is a need for corrective action. Corrective action, keyword versus warnings. Got you. So let's talk about causes for termination. I mean, with the state of Texas, the way it's arranged currently at will, talk about causes of termination. You stated previously that the employer and employee had the opportunity to basically say no, no longer, no more. But what about someone who has been in the trenches a while? Or if they haven't been in the trenches, they're relatively a new hiree. So what are some of the causes for termination? Studies have been done uh, in the state of Texas, and uh, the uh, the top five reasons for terminating an employee, this is, uh, you know, there's different words. Uh, termination just means you separated from employment. Uh, firing means that it's an employer action or termination is an employer action. Uh, Resignation is an employee action to cause the separation. Uh, There's job abandonment. People just no call, no show for a couple of days. They just don't ever come back. You never hear from them. But uh, the five reasons in, in order of significance of people terminating in Texas, number one is absenteeism. Uh, some corporations have a policy that if you don't come to work, you can't have a job. Mm -hmm. It's kind of catchy, but it's been around for over 50 years. Uh, The number two reason is a lack of interest in the job or in the concept of work. People are just lethargic. They're just not willing to learn, and they're they're not very uh, interested in uh, productivity, production. Uh, number three is continuously makes costly mistakes. Uh, we just can't keep people on the payroll that are not being productive and positive. Uh, number four is does not follow instructions. And uh, number five is shows an unwillingness to learn. 
And those are the major causes of termination. And then then you have to throw unemployment compensation into the mix because employers are concerned uh, this is a mandatory tax. Uh, the employer pays for unemployment compensation through a tax based on the amount of payroll that they pay. And the more people that claim unemployment and receive payment during a period of unemployment, the higher the tax rate goes for that employer. So the employer is uh, constantly trying to figure out ways to terminate people and not have them be eligible to claim unemployment. Let's talk about, for me, I come from Michigan, and it's a union state, union environment. That's the North. But I know that at one point or another, a lot of people were talking about progressive discipline, you know, where you try and correct and you try and help them be better and so on and so forth. But is progressive discipline even a methodology that is viable with the millennials? Well, uh, it's interesting how that has developed and, and it does have to do with whether or not it's a state like New York and Michigan and California, mostly the East Coast and the West Coast, are not right-to-work states. And so if a union is formed, then everyone that's eligible in that classification or of work, they have to join the union. True. And they have to pay their dues. True. If you If you get hired into a job where there's a union – and you have 30 days in which to join the union or the employer has to terminate you. In a right-to-work state, and there are 27 states right now, a little over half that, that are right-to-work states, and this was based on the, uh, the National, Relation, uh, National Labor Relations Act of 1935 that started all of this uh, uh, idea of legal unionization. But anyway, uh, if the employer is in a union situation and they've negotiated a contract, then the employees have to join. But here's what I'm uh, going to say about progressive discipline. Progressive discipline is a concept originated by unions and governments to make it very difficult to actually fire someone or terminate them. They want to have as many steps in there as they can. And when you look at union contracts and you look at government, federal government, state government policies, uh, you, you, you not only get an oral warning and a written warning uh, and a final warning, but then when it comes time to actually be terminated, you have an appeal process. You can appeal to uh, various levels within the organizations. And uh, in, in many government, uh, I mean union contracts, uh, you, you could stretch out this appeal and then eventually it goes to some sort of a, a uh, arbitration. And there's probably six or eight steps involved. And uh, over half the time, you're going to get your job back. They're not actually going to be able to terminate you. In the private enterprise, the private sector, and this is most businesses, uh, progressive discipline is not even required. There is no rule of three strikes and you're out. It's not written into the labor law. Uh, it's not required. And so it's a development that people have hooked onto, sort of like the baseball game, you know, one strike, two strikes, three strikes, you're out. You go back to the bench. Uh, and that's where the concept came from. But uh, it's not really a requirement in private enterprise to, uh, to have an oral warning, a written warning, a, a suspension would be another suspension with or without pay, uh, and then finally termination. If the violation is serious enough, then under the at-will terminology that's accepted in many, many states, the at-will employment relationship, uh, you can terminate an employee for any reason or for no reason as long as it's not an illegal reason. And the illegal reasons are based on discrimination laws 
you can't fire a person because of their race, national origin, age over 40, uh, gender, uh, religion, or disability. Those are called protected classes. But any other reason, and when I do uh, training seminars, I I, I sometimes use a, a silly example of uh, <clears throat> what's not discrimination. An employer could interview someone for a job, and they could ask during the interview, have you ever touched a violin? Have mm. you ever played a violin, or have you ever picked one up and played with it? And if they say yes, then you have the legal right to say, you know, we don't like violin players here at this place of employment, and we never hire anyone that ever touched or tried to play a violin, I'm sorry, we're not going to hire you. Now, most people will say, what? That sounds absurd. Of course, it's absurd, but it's not discrimination. There's no rule or law or regulation that protects violin players Mm. from discrimination. Mm. It has to be related to race, national origin, age, sex, religion, or disability. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in termination. You can terminate people for any reason or no reason as long as it's not related to one of those six uh, discriminatory practices. This is enlightening because the assumption has always been, or at least from what I understood, was that the progressive discipline was the best way to go to protect the employer against a lawsuit or against a claim in unemployment, they would have some sort of documentation. But that's not necessarily a written law. It's more or less, like you said, something that was hooked on to from the right to work states and their policies and processes. The unions and the government uh, agencies. The uh, <clears throat> the idea of, uh, of retribution against or a lawsuit against an employer for termination – uh, the employer, of course, you know, that like that violin example I gave you, uh, they're not really actually going to just wake up some morning and say, I'm going to fire everybody uh, that, that has red hair or I'm going to fire everybody that wears glasses. It would be legal. But employers, uh, they've spent money uh, advertising, recruiting, interviewing, selecting, training. Uh, and and they're really not anxious to get rid of people. They want people who uh, whom they've hired. Uh, they want them to stay a long, long time uh, as long as they're uh, able to work and productive. And so uh, they're not really going to arbitrarily uh, terminate people for no good reason. I'm not saying that uh, that they would do that. I'm saying it's legal to do that, and employees have to understand uh, that they they could be terminated for any reason or no reason, as long as it's not an illegal reason. And so employees do have to follow the policies and procedures, the work rules and safety rules. Uh, termination. Employees today that are terminated. Uh, besides protesting, uh, you know, verbally during the termination process, uh, sometimes they go out into the world and they're angry uh, and they file charges. They get an attorney or they find a government agency. Now, the government agencies are only going to protect the race, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, uh, handicaps, and but uh, the the attorneys will take any kind of case. Uh, they'll take ten poorly structured, unrealistic cases and try to settle two of them and get some money. And uh, they they uh, come up with words like uh, "you were fired uh, for retaliation." You were fired and you, you caused the employer caused intentional infliction of emotional distress. I mean, I mean, who's stressed and who's not? Well, that's a very individual, uh, individualistic uh, feeling or call. But the attorneys throw that in defamation of character, invasion of privacy, uh, intentional interference with contractual obligations. 
Uh, negligent hiring is something that came up. Negligent hiring is a concept that's been around for about 15 years, and the attorneys love this. But what it says, let me just give you an example. Uh, say you, uh, uh, you, in, you have a company and you install garage doors, and you hire technicians who go to people's houses and they install garage doors. The owner may be there. The owner may not be there. But this technician ends up committing a crime, stealing something, vandalizing something, uh, molesting someone. Well, then the attorney is going to say that the employer did a poor job of screening and hiring and training and supervising this employee, particularly when they find out that that technician had a criminal record. The employer could be found guilty of negligent hiring. They should have known. They should have been prudent. They should have been good, smart business people. Wow. They should not have put a criminal, criminally known, criminal record person, technician, into that person's house. So now it's not only the person who committed the crime. They don't have any money. There's no lawsuit there. Where's the lawsuit? The lawsuit's against the employer for negligent hiring. Wow. That's a description of negligent hiring uh, that's quite common today. And so now the employers are doing pre-employment screening, not only interviewing. They give them they can give personality tests. They do criminal history backgrounds. Uh, they check their educational to see if they really do have the education they claim. Uh, they can check the uh, uh, their resident location for the last seven years to see if they're lying on the application. And, of course, they do drug testing. Mm -hmm. wow. So that's why all of these pre-employment tests – have come into play so that the employer is pretty confident that they've done a good job of selecting, hiring, training, and of course, supervising. So Chris, tell us about financial planning. What is it? Well, I know it's a very vague term and a lot of people have a lot of different definitions, but financial planning for business owners especially is the combination of the personal and business planning. It looks like a Venn diagram. So most people either treat them all the same and have everything commingled, or the other group of people treat them completely separate. Whereas you want to look at it like a Venn diagram where you have two overlapping circles because one is obviously going to impact the other. So if you are sole investor or sole owner of this business, that's going to be responsible for providing the income, putting food on the table, making sure that everything on a daily basis is good, not just in your business for your employees and your clients or customers, but also for your family. How do those different circles interact with one another and how do we need to separate them whenever we're supposed to, but make sure that we're taking into consideration that overlapping area? So, Chris, how can we get a hold of you for more information? Well, our main office is in San Antonio off of 281 and Bitters. We also have a website, pontemfinancial.com, P-O-N-T-E-M financial.com. And we're also on LinkedIn, Facebook. And, of course, we have a phone, 210-625-4845, to reach out to a member of my team or myself. Thank you, Chris. Chris Hall is a financial advisor and partner with Pontum Financial in San Antonio, Texas. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor. Member FINRA slash SIPC. Let's digress a little bit and talk about corrective actions before it gets to termination. What are potential corrective actions that an employer could take to retain this employee. I mean, they started out blazing. They came out the gate awesome. You know, we hired them. They did the pre-employment screening. They passed the test. They got into the workplace. They started doing well. Then all of a sudden, some things started going kind of wonky. Some things started going out of the normal range of what they had exhibited before. So how can we do corrective action? Well, well first, let me say that I do believe in some progressive discipline. Uh, I don't think any employer is, a, you know, going to just terminate you the first time you make a mistake. 
uh, during the initial employment period, which is commonly called the probation period of uh, 90 days, but I, I like to use three months. It's easier to keep track of three months than it is 90 days. But uh, during that probationary period or that initial employment period, of course, the employer expects the employee to do the best job they can, but they're also in a training mode. Yeah, that learning curve. uh, That learning curve, of course. And and they're also getting to know uh, other people, uh, the company, the uh, The culture, the culture of that company, Mm -hmm. how to dress, how to talk. Uh, where do, where do we eat lunch and, and uh, where do we park and things like that. But if this good employee suddenly starts uh, misbehaving and discipline is called for, I've devised a, a system that really uh, divides these disciplinary categories into two major topics. Okay, let's hear. Well, In the first place, there are some employee responsibilities, things that are work-related. So these are the things that the employer should should really be judging. Uh, There are things like work quality, uh, good use of time, uh, customer service issues, uh, cooperating with others, getting along with the people you work with, uh, safety and health is is part of the job, uh, telephone use, and right now in America, uh, cell phone abuse is a major corporate problem for small businesses and large businesses because people are addicted to their cell phones and they would rather do that than work. So that's a that's a whole other topic. Uh, Work-related things also include uh, maintaining confidentiality, uh, proper housekeeping, picking up after yourself, cleaning up your own mess, attendance and tardiness, uh, following the employee handbook, and uh, the judicious use of equipment and supplies. Now, those are, those are work-related things that the employer has every right to judge and, and to expect uh, – good behavior, and good performance. But there's a whole other list of things that I have, uh, that first list is employee responsibilities, work-related. But there's a whole lot of things that employees can mess up on that are not work-related, and I call those prohibitive or prohibited conduct. For instance, and, and there's sort of Two categories, work-related and not work-related, uh, arguing, fighting, insubordination. You, you weren't hired for that. It's not part of your job, but it happens in the, in the workplace, but it's, a, it's, it's a not work-related. Uh, theft, security issues, abusive language and profanity, uh, conducting personal business while you're on the clock being paid to conduct the employer's business. Uh, conflict of interest that mm. includes a lot of things. Sleeping on the job, yeah, when you don't have a job that allows you to sleep, yeah. right? Uh, alcohol and drugs, uh, soliciting and distributing, solicitation and distribution means uh, you know you've got a little side business that you're running from, out of that business yeah. from work, or mm-hmm. uh, that includes things like lottery tickets and football pools. I mean, people are being paid to work not to be talking to you about uh, the football pool and here's $5 and I hope I win $50, not work-related, discrimination and harassment, not really work-related, smoking and talking on the cell phone. So there's there's sort of a list uh, of some things that are work-related that can be violated and a list of things that are just personal prohibitive conduct that you can also get in trouble with. And that's how I divide those two things. And uh, when when either of those categories, any of those categories are violated, I, I think the employer should immediately respond to that. And we started this conversation talking about how there's a reluctance to discipline, to talk to people. Uh, to judge them because people don't don't accept that sometimes that judgment uh, that discernment uh, 
that criticism. They, they look at it a lot of different ways, but my, my recommendation for management is that you just don't let anything slide mm. and that you do respond to that in a kind way. And uh, I believe in the oral warning. Even the oral warning should be written down. You don't have to give it to the employee. And by the way, there's no, there's no requirement in private enterprise that employees receive copies of everything. Mm. And I really don't think it's smart to give employees copies of everything because all they're going to do is take it home and show their spouse and show their neighbors and show the attorney. If the employee has only their memory, but the employer has documentation, when it gets to the Texas Workforce Commission or any agency, who's going to win? The one that has the documentation. And that was going to be my next question because protection of the business ultimately is what the owner wants to do. I mean, that's their baby. That's their livelihood, especially in a small business, you know, and they try to be, um, how can you say, uh, protective of their business. And that's why a lot of them sometimes are reluctant to hire individuals because of some of those fears. They've heard horror stories from potentially some of the other small business counterparts, or they've just seen things that make them reluctant to want to hire someone because of the fear of discipline or the aggravation of hiring the wrong person. Well, yes, and and some employers, uh, particularly small businesses where the owner is the employer and the manager, and uh, that's that's most small businesses, particularly the first generation of establishing that business, uh, some of those owners have an authoritarian, uh, autocratic attitude about, you know, I'm the owner, I'm the boss, I'm the man, I'm the king, or a woman, I'm the queen. And, you know, you just can't argue with me because we just get rid of you. If you cause us any problem, we get rid of you. Of course, that causes high turnover, uh, more recruitment, more training, more unemployment compensation, higher taxes. And so uh, employers have learned not to do that. And then secondarily, there's that reluctance to judge people and to discipline people. But uh, as I was saying, even an oral warning, when you have a discussion with somebody uh, and I'm not really talking about the, the first few weeks of employment where you expect them to be new and to make mistakes and to have some some scrap material generated. Uh, but after they, they've been trained and they know better and they, they know what the policies are, uh, even an oral warning should be documented. And the way you do that is you just write yourself a letter to the file. Hmm. Or you write it down on your calendar or you have a uh, you just type something in your computer under your name. You don't have to show that Mm -hmm. because what happens is if that employee has a repeat of problems and another repeat of problems and then you terminate them within the Texas Workforce Commission, they want to say, well, did you warn them? It's not required by law. But they really like to see, well, yes, we had a discussion on this date and we had another discussion on the second date. And here's the notes that I took about that discussion. And so you have documentation to support the reason for the termination. There there are reasons for terminations. I'm not sitting here uh, in the studio saying that nobody should be terminated. There are lots of reasons that people are fired uh, and terminated. Uh, and I've given you a long list of those reasons, and it eventually, even though the uh, manager, the supervisor, you might like the person, uh, if they're not helping your business, you just can't afford to keep them. True. And they need to go. So what are some of the corrective actions that potentially could be put in place that an employer could use? You know, like I'm at a loss. Well, how can I correct this behavior or how can I implement a change that will help them be better because they're good workers or they're just having a rough patch, but I need to nip it in the bud. So what are some of the things they can do potentially to help that process? 
Well, most employers uh, do not have formal training programs. I'll just say that up front. Major corporations, they do. Uh, a major corporation, when you first go to work, they might have a week or two. Uh, they might have trainers. They might have uh, laboratories where you you sit in the lab and you practice. Uh, but small employers, uh, their their training methods are welcome to the work. We hired you either because of your experience or because uh, we like your attitude and uh, you seem to get along with people or you seem to be smart. They don't really know that, but they've judged that during the interview process. And they put you with an experienced worker, and that's your training. OJT. It's on-the-job training. Uh, just go ahead and start doing it and, and follow the instructions of this person that I'm putting you with or the leader or the supervisor or whatever level uh, the trainer is, and then you, you're on you're you're taken off, and eventually you do learn, and you do succeed. Uh, when once a person starts failing, and they're not successful on the job, then you go back to that stage, and you remind them. Remember the the written warning is now a written reminder. You remind them. Well, here's what you told us you would do or you could do, and here's the training that we provided. And you need to point out very carefully what, what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, the danger is, and I just I do a lot of management seminars, and here's my recommendation. Do not get involved in the personal life of your employee. Mm. An employer cannot solve, and it is not their place to solve the personal problems of their employees. And think about it. Those problems are financial, marital, drugs, uh, un un unwed pregnancies, uh, their kids dropped out of high school, uh, the kids got arrested. I mean, a lot of personal problems affect work. In the workplace. True. But the employer, once they find out, and this employee does say, well, I'm having problems with whatever the personal problem is, the employer cannot solve that problem. The employer can't give them more money. Employer can't fix their marital relations. Uh, the employer needs to stay completely out of the personal lives of their employees because it's crossing the line. It's not in the employer-employee relationship. And as soon as you get involved on a personal basis, the employment relationship deteriorates and the employee is very confused. Are you my boss? Or are you my friend? True. And Makes as a, a friend, difference. I have higher expectations. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a challenge for small businesses because they get attached to their employees. If they only have three or four employees, you know, they're like, OK, well, I recognize something that you've told me and I can now notice that it's impacting your work performance. I want to help, but I also know that my business has to survive. Sure. So understanding and keeping that line clear, that line of demarcation, easier said than done. Many employers like on a personal basis and become friends with their employees, particularly the long time, long term employees. But they also need to figure out and what they can tell someone. Uh, let, let's say that a long time employee gets cancer. Well, how long do you leave that person as an employee? You can't pay them other than their paid time off, vacation, sick leave. You, you can't keep them on the payroll for months and months. Your business would suffer for that. But what you can do and the kind thing to do is say is to have a written policy that if an employee does not come to work for X amount of time, 30 days, 45 days, they will be terminated. It doesn't matter what the reason is. And that's because they're not available to work. And employees have to come to work 
to have a job. And so you have that in your policy, in the employee handbook. You have some some cutoff that in all cases of a person not being able to work for a period of time, and I recommend starting at 30 days, but some companies like 45, some will even give them 60. They're not being paid, but their insurance continues. And that mm-hmm. might be important, but eventually that ends and then they have to take their uh, continuing health insurance through through the, the legal way, which is called COBRA. Uh, but at least you terminate them when they reach that that point of your limit. And you tell them in a kind way, now, when you recover, when you beat the cancer or when you get over whatever the problem is, uh, you're welcome to apply again. Do not say things like, you always have a job here. That's a promise. Do not say, you have the first right of recall. That's a promise of a job. Uh, you may not want that person back after they've been absent for a period of time, after they've had an illness, an accident, a disability, gone through a divorce, uh, or or had a nervous breakdown. I mean, you you don't want to promise people that they'll they'll have a job. What you tell them, and it's a kind thing to say, is please feel free to come and apply for a job, and we will consider you the same as every other applicant. Mm. See, that gives you hope mm-hmm. that well, if I if I beat this problem, then there is a chance I can come back. I feel better. Right. But also helps protect the employer in case that that person does come back and say, well, you promised me. And then the emotional aspect gets involved versus the business aspect. Then you begin to feel obligated. And if you weren't real happy with that person before, um, you're now like, oh, I've got to because I want to keep my word, integrity, so on and so forth. So you want to, like you said, be careful about what you say to that particular employee, but having it written in black and white in the handbook. And that'd be another topic to talk about what to include in the handbook, the employee handbook. So that'd be another topic for us to discuss at a later date. It'll make a great podcast uh, right. to talk about employee handbooks. Uh, the topic today, of course, is discipline at work. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten around to exactly what is discipline. And I'd like to take a minute and explain that uh, different managers, owners, supervisors, uh, foremen, uh, whatever the the job title is of of someone who's in charge, uh, uh, there's a wide variety of definitions or thought processes about discipline. And uh, first of all, there's about five different kinds of negative discipline. What are they? Uh, negative discipline uh, is a punitive discipline. It's an autocratic style to where I'm the boss, don't argue with me, uh, I don't have to be reasonable because I have all the power and uh, you're just a worker and you're not important to me, do what I say or you're out of here. Uh, there's rule by fear, and that's sort of the autocratic, uh, the king thing to where uh, your policies are enforced uh, by carrying a big stick. And so the negative, punitive, autocratic, rule by fear, and the big stick discipline, they all lump into the same category. And some people still have still have that. It's sort of like... Uh, some young men love their fathers and some don't love their fathers because of the method of discipline. Mm -hmm. And some of it is legal discipline to your children and some is illegal discipline. You know, that's another subject. But uh, some people have that concept of I'm the owner, I'm the boss, I'm over you, I'm more important than you, you're not important. And they let people know that. And then you you get into, uh, there's uh, two or three other kinds. One is called situational discipline. 
Mm, sounds like situational ethics almost. Uh, it is, and uh, that's uh, a little bit of a contradiction because uh, you you want to be consistent. True, because there are people watching. And, and they are, and they're always worried about what's in it for me. And am I being left out? And I made up a saying that uh, you probably haven't heard before, but I tell employers this all the time. Employers sometimes want to do their employees favors because they like them. They want to help them. And I have I made up this saying, the opposite of favoritism is discrimination. Hmm. So if you come to me as an employee and you say, well, I have a I have a financial situation and I I uh, I advance you a thousand dollars on next month's paycheck or I loan you a thousand dollars then automatically anyone that any other employee that finds out about that could come to you and say, well, I have a financial situation and I'm here for my thousand dollars. If you don't do that, and by the way, that's called a rule by practice. Some rules are not written down, but if you have a practice in your place of employment of doing a certain thing or behaving in a certain way, that becomes your rule. Hmm. And the judge and the lawyers and the government, they'll enforce that rule because that's your consistency. And so you have to be very careful about doing something for one person or one group and not making it available. Those other people could then say, well, you know, uh, you 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 advance a thousand dollars to to Doris, but you didn't do it for me, and I think it's because of my race, national origin, age, sex, religion, or disability. All they have to do is pick one. True. And now they have a claim of discrimination because they weren't treated the same as the other person. So uh, when it comes to discipline, you, you, you always want to keep in mind that uh, what you're, what you're doing is setting a precedence and other people are seeing it and it's enforceable. Okay. Is there anything positive about discipline? Uh, Yes, there is. And there's actually, uh, uh, terminology that's been created. Uh, I was telling you about situational discipline. That's where you decide on, on the whole, the whole situation, the, um, the employees work record, their attendance record, their safety record, uh, how many written warnings have they had in the past, uh, or corrective actions. And then what was the cost of this loss or this damage or this altercation, whatever the problem was. And then you come up with a fair form of discipline. Uh, there's also one called uh, preventive discipline. There's one, of course, we've talked about it extensively, progressive discipline. But the one you haven't heard of before is called positive discipline. It was created in about 1988 by a company in Dallas uh, called Wright Associates, and they came up with a form of positive discipline, and here's how it works. Let's say that, that you, Thalia, are an employee and you, you have violated our rules and we uh, are thinking about terminating you, but we're going to give you one last chance. Okay. So here's your chance. I call you in a private meeting and I tell you, Thalia, because of your misbehavior or your mess up or your whatever the problem was, and it could be dozens of different things that have gone wrong, uh, I'm going to suspend you for three days with pay. And I want you to go home and I want you to explain to your spouse what happened husband or wife, and be sure and tell them that you're on full payroll and benefits while you're thinking about this. Mm. And the day that you come back after your three-day suspension with pay, come immediately to my office, and I'm going to ask you one question. Thalia, do you want to work here going forward, or do you want to resign now. 
Wow. So I've given you something to think about. True. And if you say that you want to go ahead and continue working here going forward, I'm going to tell you, Thalia, we're never having this conversation again. The very next time there's a violation will be your last day. Is there any part of that you don't understand? Now, I'm talking seriously here. You can oh, hear yeah. it in my voice. Oh, yeah. Because I'm serious. I treated you really nicely. Because you could have terminated me at that point based on the yes. infraction. But I'm letting you decide about your job and your future. It's not my job. It's your job. It's your paycheck. It's your benefits. It's you getting all the things that come with a job. Mm -hmm. And we know the significance of work as, a, as opposed to those who don't work or those who are unemployed. And so uh, jobs have significance in our, in our well-being. And so this positive discipline that I've just described is a very serious matter, and you only get to go through that one time. Mm -hmm. We're not going to, uh, you know, once a year, you don't get three days off with pay. This mm -hmm. is the one and only time, and you have to make the decision, and it's your decision. If you tell me that you want to stay, I believe you, and we're going to go forward in a positive way. Clean slate almost. That's right. Mm, that's interesting. And that's a concept that has not been spoken of or it's in a very few companies that actually give that onus to the employee because it has to be a very broad, open-minded employer that even considers that, especially here in Texas. But in on the flip side of that too, with the employment rate the way it is, you almost want to keep all of your employees that are still working for you but you also want to put the onus on them to find out, do you really want to work here? And that that is powerful in itself because that allows that employee to really make a determination or do they want to work here? It's a commitment mm -hmm. that they've thought through. And, of course, I think their spouse and their family will have some influence because – I instructed you to go talk to your family about this. Mm -hmm. and, and they're thinking, wow, what a great place to work. You, you screwed up and you still got paid for three days. You messed off. up and you're sitting here at home getting paid. Uh, wow, what a company. Why wouldn't you want to stay? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so as we looked at uh, the definitions of discipline, uh, we got down to positive discipline uh, not negative discipline. Discipline is not a punishment. And let me just give you a few new terms that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, one definition of discipline, uh, you can look these up in the dictionary or in uh, in uh, employment books. Uh, discipline can be training that corrects, molds, strengthens, or perfects. And some employers look at discipline as training. When you when you uh, when you spank your child at home, you don't hate them. You don't want to kill them. You don't want to ruin them. You want to help them. And I know that uh, when I I raised four children, and uh, after I had to discipline them, and sometimes it was a spanking, I would just love the heck out of them, mm -hmm. and let them know that it's I don't I don't I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at that behavior you had there. And, uh, yeah, that spanking uh, hurt a little bit, but daddy still is here to take care of you. And so training can be part of discipline. And then another uh, definition of discipline is control, gained by enforcing obedience. Now, there's some strong words in there. It's where don't do that again. And I'm forcing you to change your behavior. And then, of course, uh, and, and that's not as friendly as training. That's control. And then back to that old definition of negative is training could be punishment mm -hmm. or chastisement or embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And uh, most employers don't want to go that way. But I have to tell you, there are autocratic managers and owners and supervisors out there in the United States. Now, now, 
if you haven't studied the subject, you might not know that we manage people in the United States differently than they manage people in other countries. They have they have historical methodologies. Uh, we manage people through a process of the last two hundred years, uh, particularly the last hundred and fifty years. Uh, that we've developed a way of managing people. And, of course, our labor laws are based on that style of management. But there are people out there who are violators, mm-hmm. uh, uh, managers, supervisors, and business owners who really don't care whether you come or you stay as long as you do exactly what they tell you. And they're they're quick to get rid of people if they have a reason to. Undoubtedly. Wow. This has been a very potent hour of conversation about discipline and work. So let's do a quick summation, Larry, and then give people contact information for you if they want more of your information and training. So let's do a quick summation. Well, the summation for me would be that uh, employers, uh, supervisors, and managers uh, should not be reluctant to judge, to evaluate, their workers. And when they find that they're short and shortcomings, they they need to confront that because people only learn through additional training. And if that training needs to be accompanied by discipline, then so be it. But that's the way they learn. If you just take the attitude and, you know, back to parenting, parents and children, I've had a lot of parents say, no, I just let them do whatever they want. I just let them pick their own religion. I just let them decide whether they want to go to school or not. I just let them decide who their friends are. Okay, you're taking a big risk. There's just no training there. And uh, I was never that type of parent with my children. And I think the employer has these uh, work standards. They have goals. They have policies and procedures, and they need to train, and they need to use discipline. And don't be afraid to do that. Uh, Not everybody is going to turn around and sue you because you frowned at them. Uh, So use the discipline, but use the progressive discipline. Uh, Be kind to people. And uh, a few companies will even use positive discipline, but not very many. Understood. So how can someone get in contact with you for more training or to bring you in to do an assessment or whatever their needs might be in the HR space? Yeah, my uh, my human resource background is really in uh, being a human resource manager for companies. So I've learned a lot about not only labor law, but uh, settling disputes and uh, uh, getting along with people from the company president down to the custodian. I don't know why we always pick on the custodian, but we do. And and uh, so I've, I've seen a lot, work for some major corporations and some small businesses. And, of course, I'm a small business person myself. Uh, my telephone number, if you w- would like to get free telephone consultation, I never charge for phone calls. Just call me and say, I have a situation I'd like to discuss or get your advice on, completely free. And the phone number in San Antonio is 210-316-4206. I have a website. It's called managementresolve.com. All one word, managementresolve.com. And if you go to the website, you'll... Uh, learn about the things that I do in my consulting and my my background. And there's also about 35 articles that I've written on different HR and management topics. And you can see the articles uh, just at the top of the top of the page, my website. It'll say articles. Click on that. You'll get a list of the articles. Click on the article. You can read the article. Wonderful. So it's a really uh, a free resource. Uh, because I like to share with uh, people and help them as much as I can. And what's your email address? Uh, it's very simple. Larry, L-A-R-R-Y dot A, which is my middle initial, dot Hobbs, H-O-B-B-S at Gmail. Larry dot A dot Hobbs at Gmail dot com. 
Wow. Well, thank you, Larry, so much for coming in. We appreciate it. And until we talk again, you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye now. For more information about any of our guests, or if you have questions and comments, please email us at admin at plemonscpa.com. And don't forget to check out our website, plemonscpa.com, for upcoming events and workshops in San Antonio. David B. Plemons CPA Inc. is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of David B. Plemons CPA Inc. policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by David B. Plemons CPA Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the Hustle, Juggle, and Struggle of Small Business podcast does not imply an endorsement of them or their concepts or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by David B. Plemons CPA Inc. employees are those of the employees and do not necessarily reflect the views of David B. Plemons CPA Inc. or any of its officials. You should always consult your own investment advisors, attorneys, and accountants before making any decisions concerning your financial matters. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our office.